Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our special lecture on topic, Lease Discovery and Development. Today, we are pleased to have Associate Professor Dr. Shanin Nantase Namat to be our special lecturer. Associate Professor Dr. Shanin is currently a senior developer advocate. Now we will start. Everybody, please welcome Associate Professor Dr. Shanin Nantase Namat. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Cup, for your uh, warm welcome. Okay, anyways, um, today we're going to take a look at lead discovery and development. And um, as Gunnatana has already mentioned, I'm currently working as a senior developer advocate. And toward the end of the presentation, I'll probably talk about, um, I'm going to show you what I'm doing over at Streamlit. And I think it might be interesting to you um, as a graduate student or also as a researcher um, doing work in computational drug discovery because um, what we're working at over at Streamlit is to make web application um, development very easy. So you don't have to have any um, strong knowledge in uh, front end or like HTML. And if you know like basic Python, you could write a web application and actually right now I'm writing a book chapter on how you could develop a bioinformatics tool uh, using Streamlit. And so um, I'll show you the benefit of that in just a moment. And so as mentioned already, I'm currently a senior developer advocate. Um, I transitioned into big tech um, since late last year. And so prior to that, I was an associate professor and also former head of the Center of Data Mining and Biomedical Informatics over at the Faculty of Medical Technology, um, Mahidon University. Um, I was the head since 2011, and I've worked at Mahidon University since, I think it's 2006 for the past uh, 15 years. And during those time, I was fortunate to uh, had a research group that publishes about um, more than 150 publications. So this is a, a little bit outdated. Right, so uh, other than that, I'm also a part-time YouTuber. Um, during the night, I create content, um, educational content on data science, bioinformatics, and I upload it to my YouTube channel, Data Professor, and also my second YouTube channel, Coding Professor. And I also write blogs on Medium. So like how to get started how in, in data science, how to get started in bioinformatics, how to learn Python, um, all of those I'm teaching for free on these three platform. And I've also collaborated with the Free Code Camp YouTube channel to provide tutorials on those topics as well. And so let's jump back to the topic that we're going to talk about today, which is lead discovery and development. But before going there, let's have a look at the terminology first. So disease is defined by the Cambridge Dictionary as the illness of people, animals, plants, and they are caused by infection or the failure of health rather than by an accident. So it is induced by extrinsic factor or also intrinsic factor um, that are that could also be arising from complicated like genetic uh, predisposition. And drug, if you think of it, drug is like a chemical or biological entity that you take in order to all you know to alter or modulate the this state. And if you look under the hood, the drug will interact with target proteins and then they will undergo some form of um, metabolic pathway, which they will be interfering with and modulating, or like, for example, it might inhibit particular protein protein interaction, and then it will induce a downstream effect that will prevent the downstream effect of the metabolic pathway. So that's the under the hood of what a drug is and how does it work. And so as I've mentioned already, if you take a look at the 
at this big map, you're going to see that there's four entities here. Um, actually, drug is spelled wrong. So you have drug and then you have target. So drug will interact with the target, right? And then it will induce modifications like downstream effect. It could induce um, effects to genes. It could then cause um, disease modifying effects. And then you're going to see that the the network, like protein, protein interaction network, the drug disease network, drug target network, all of these will be kind of like a big spider web. And it would then become unclear which particular path will be responsible for the disease. And that's why there should be a big systematic study in order to study all of the, the entire intricate pharmacological network. Oh, let me make it full screen, sorry. Okay, so you're gonna see that the drug discovery process is a very time consuming endeavor. Um, it could take anywhere between 10 to 15 years or even longer. And there, there have been cases that might not take as much as 10 years. And so that's a special case. Um, so I'll, I'm going to talk about that in just a moment. And drug discovery is a very financially taxing endeavor because typically it'll cost like two billion US dollar um, in order to do the R&D research and discovery development and also to bring it to market. And the failure rate is rather high, more than 90%. And even if a drug is brought to the market, it could also be retracted as well because um, if it induces severe side effects that um, or not safe to consume by patients, then it could be retracted from the market. So you're going to see that the entire drug discovery process will be comprised of the following in this um, schematic illustration published in the Nature Review Drug Discovery in 2004. So I've also annotated at the top and the bottom the key information for each of the steps. So let's take a look at the steps from left to right. So you're gonna start with the tar target drug discovery, I mean, the target discovery. And so what this in involved is the identification of the target protein. And so in order to tackle a disease, the first thing is to identify what is the target that is responsible for the disease. And so this could involve performing in vivo experiments or in vitro, like knockouting, knocking out particular genes to see whether the disease are there or not. Um, and so this step will allow you to identify the responsible target um, for the disease. And if you move to the next step, you're going to try to find which chemical or biological entity. But then for the most part, most of the drug discovery effort are focused more on the small molecule, although there are bigger macromolecule that could be used as drug as well. But uh, for the sake of simplicity, we're going to focus more in small molecule and in the general uh, context of drug discovery, the assumption is talking about the small molecule. So typically what you want to do is once you identify a target protein, like for example, for breast cancer, there is the aromatase protein. And so what you want to do is you want to find molecules that could bind to the aromatase target protein. And so you're going to perform a high throughput screening experiment. It could be done uh, experimentally in wet lab situation, or also it could be done in silico um, using structure-based drug discovery, like for example, the molecular docking approach. Um, what you're doing there is you're 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 taking a large chemical library and then one by one, you're going to figure out how does each of the molecule binds to the target protein and what is the affinity or how well do they bind and how well do they inhibit the function of the target protein. The next step is once you have identified from a large collection, oh, sorry, from a large collection of chemical compounds, 
you want to narrow it down, right? For example, if you, you started from 1 million compounds to bind to the spe specific target protein, you have identified perhaps five out of 1 million. What you want to do then is you want to take the five molecule, you want to perform structure activity relationship study to figure out what is the common pattern of the five molecule that binds well to the target protein. And so in performing the structure activity relationship, this is typically performed by medicinal chemists. And what it involves is it might also involve the generation of lead molecule. So therefore, we're going to need to do hit to lead conversion. So we're going to take the hit molecule, which we obtained from the initial screening, and then we're going to perform some more refinements. We're going to convert the hit to the lead. And what this essentially means is that we're going to modify the hit molecule in all possible ways. So if you think of it as like a Lego, a molecule as like a Lego, where a molecule will be comprised here. So I have a molecule here. If you think of a molecule as a Lego, then you have the building blocks, right? So here you have the OH, the hydroxy group. So what if I take the OH out and then I replace it with another group like a NH3, an amine, or what if I replace it with something else, right? Like a fluorine or a bromine. So therefore that is the essence of hit to lead. So you're, 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 kind of, you're taking a hit and then you're making it into a lead molecule. And then for the lead molecule, you're gonna generate like hundreds more, okay? So you're gonna generate like all possible combination. Like you're gonna take this as the base molecule. So sometimes we call it a scaffold. And then we're gonna modify this position. And so we could call this like R1. And then we're gonna modify this to something else. We could call it R2. And then we could modify this part as something else. And then we could call it R3. But then the, the commonality is that you're going to keep the, the scaffold or the core of the molecule intact, unchanged. Okay, so what you have then is you have taken the lead molecule and then you have generated 100 additional variants. And then you will perform some additional structure activity relationship. Okay, so this typically involves more um, analytics approach, uh, which I will be covering in just a moment. And when you're modifying the molecule, the lead molecule into 100 possibility, into 100 variants, what you're also trying to achieve is you want to improve the ADMET property, the absorption, the distribution, the metabolism, the excretion, and the toxicity of the molecule. So you want to minimize all of that. And as you might know, it is very difficult to have a perfect drug that will be potent, will bind tightly to the target molecule and induce no side effect, meaning it doesn't have any undesirable admit property. This is a very big challenge because the fact is that molecules that have good admit property might not bind well to the target protein and molecule that binds well to the target protein might have poor admit properties. And so there might be some trade-off. And after you have identified some promising lead molecules, then you wanna proceed further with preclinical clinical trials. And before it reaches the market, you will see that the development aspect, like the clinical trial aspect could take up to five to six years. And the registration could take up to one to two years. And so you're gonna see that the entire process here is very lengthy. And as I have already mentioned already that when you're starting from a large chemical library and then you're narrowing it down um, from a big library to some potential hits, and then you're taking some potential hit and then you're generating more variants of it, which you call the lead molecule. And then you have optimization as I've already mentioned that you're trying to generate 100 or 200 different variants but then you're trying to optimize them as well, right? So as I already mentioned about the R1, R2, R3, the, if you have figured out that R1 is most important for the molecule activity toward the target protein, 
then your emphasis will focus more on R1. And as, you, as your research might have shown, for example, R2 and R3 does not have any effect on the target protein binding or efficiency, then therefore it solidified that you will focus only on R1 optimization. And so here are some additional information summarized in this particular slide. And you're gonna see that essentially this is an optimization problem. So we could convert this into a mathematical optimization problem. And we do that, for example, previously in, in my own research group, we do that by performing quantitative structure activity relationship study, where we take a large chemical library, we describe them in terms of the molecular descriptor, and then we build a machine learning model out of that, like for example, using random forest algorithm. And then afterward, the model will have the Gini index that we could extract information from. The Gini index will tell us how each of the feature are contributing to the prediction of the activity. Similar to a linear regression, the coefficient will tell you which molecular feature or which variable are important. And if they are important, it means that they are most likely to contribute to the biological activity in a favorable or an unfavorable way. So that really depends on um, how you formulate your height analysis. And so the goal here is to start from a million starting chemical starting points to derive at a few molecule that will have good biological activity. And so the machine learning model that I have already mentioned is typically performed by researchers and then they're published in research paper. But then the, the great challenge is most of these knowledge are locked in the static research paper as only a research table result. And so when, when I was in academia, what we did was we, we take the machine learning model that we publish, and then we take it a step further. We shared it on GitHub, which is a code repository, kind of like a database of code and data, raw data, that we collected during our research projects. And then we share the entire project so that other researcher, graduate students or researcher professors could have access to that for free. They could download a local copy of it and then they could add their own value to the analysis. And in order to, to take that a step further, the thing is if we share our code and data it might mean that the researchers would then have, would require strong te technical skill in order to make use of the data. So what we did was we take it a step further. We've taken the data and then we created a web tool, a web application. When it becomes a web application, it means that anyone could use that web application to figure out whether their molecule, like a curcumin derivative, will be a potential aromatase inhibitor or not. So that will reduce the technical threshold that is required to make use of the research finding. And I highly believe that this will be the, the new trend in the future. And it is starting to be so, where most of the research work are now a hybrid between theoretical and experimental endeavor. And so if you could design a large chemical library, then you test it experimentally, you build a machine learning model. And so the natural next step would be to share the model with the world as a web application. So I'll show the, if, if you're interested, I'll show you that in one moment. And as I've already mentioned, the the optimization of a drug at net property, the at absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion, tox toxicity. It is a multi-objective optimization. Multi-objective means you want to have the 
drug to be effective in inhibiting the protein, you also want it to have favorable absorption, favorable distribution, favorable metabolism, excretion, and also to be non-toxic. And an additional parameter here, as I have already added to the list, is it is also feasible to be synthesized in the chemical laboratory by medicinal chemists, because a molecule that is very difficult to synthesize will not be one that could be taken into consideration by the scientists. And so you're going to see that we have to strike an intricate balance between all of the objectives, and it's therefore very challenging. And if we take a step back and then try to figure out how are new compounds or new molecules designed synthetically in the lab. And so before we could do that, we must first be inspired by how nature creates the amazing bioactive compounds. And that is essentially what we do by studying and being inspired from nature, natural products. And so that is what medicinal chemists, computational scientists, or computational medchem are doing. They're taking a large chemical library, and then they're trying to do quantitative structure activity relationship study in order to figure out the contribution of each molecule, right? Because the thing is, the atom or group of atoms, or the, uh, if you, you have group of atoms, you call it a functional group. And the location of the functional group in three dimension is not random. And so if I were to move this to somewhere else, it will change the biological activity. And, and therefore, in order to figure out what, what the compound should look like in order to inhibit effectively, the target protein, this must be done through rigorous high throughput screening. Unless we could take our inspiration from existing natural product that could inhibit the target protein. All right. And so therefore, computational scientists, and this is where they come in, they are able to help the MedChem by performing what is called the compound enumeration, where molecules are generated in silico in the computer, right? They don't, they don't physically exist. They are existing in the theoretical realm. And scientists will then do some testing like molecular docking or quantitative structure activity relationship in order to see whether they are promising enough to be synthesized, right? Because if back in the days, if you wanted to know whether the molecule will be a potential drug target inhibitor or not, you have to synthesize it or buy it, and then you have to test it experimentally, right? But nowadays you could do it computationally. And typically it would have been, the thing is that back in the days, you might need to have someone in your research lab be very proficient in the skills of computational chemistry or also machine learning. But then nowadays, there are a lot of software tools that are being released and MedChem experimentalists could make use of that in their own research group. So they don't need to have too much technical knowledge, just enough to understand how the model works and if they could access it, then they could make great use of it. Okay, so if you take a look at it, I've also already mentioned, a molecule could be thought of as kind of like a graph network of atoms. And in computer science, they call it a molecular graph, right? Because each atom are connected to one another and the location, is very different and the connectivity is also different and so this could be thought of as the molecular graph and the vertices are the atoms and the edge are the bonds the chemical bonds 
And in fact, the research group of J.L. Raymond, he developed this algorithm in order to create like all possible molecules based on 13 atoms. And he published that and then he was able to obtain a total of 977 million possible molecule. And then he increased that up to 17 atom, right? So let me show you as an example. For this hypothetical, for this molecule, we have one, two. No, but actually this is 13 heavy atoms. So it doesn't include the hydrogen, the white molecule. It will not include that. So the heavy atoms will be the oxygen, carbon, and nitrogen, and phosphorus. So we have here one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this molecule is only comprised of eight heavy atoms. And that research group has created 13 atoms. So five additional heavy atoms on the molecule. And what's interesting is that aspirin was also a part of this 977 million molecule. So it goes to show that this holds very promising findings where a potential drug could be hidden in the 166 billion possible molecule. And the thing is, there's some limitation in the computer hardware if you want to scale up to even more heavy atoms, like beyond 17, right? There, there's going to be requiring a lot of computational power. And for sure, I think that is highly likely that the the drug molecule that has not yet been discovered by scientists today is hidden in one of these theoretical molecules. Okay, so the possibility, the possible, all possible chemical structure. So we call that the chemical space. Okay, so you could think of it as kind of like a chemical universe, right? A, a universe will be comprising of many stars, right? And if you imagine a chemical universe to be each star will represent a molecule. And if you look up into the sky, you're gonna see like millions of star, right? So each dot will be a molecule, but not all molecules are the same, right? Some molecules might be toxic. It might be, um, it could be beneficial to humans. Um, it could be like, for example, if, by being useful or helpful to humans, it could be like in the form of like vitamins, minerals, and also by being toxic, it could be like toxins, toxic molecule, um, pesticides. I mean, they're, they're useful, but then they're, they're detrimental to human health. So there, there might be a dual role, like both good and bad. So they're in that chemical space. And therefore a subset of the chemical space we're gonna call it the drug space, right? So as I already mentioned, not all compounds could be a drug, right? So a subset of that, like a small portion of that could be a drug. And there's a scientist who's analyzed all of the drug, like all of the drug molecule, and he coined this to be drug-like molecule, meaning that from his analysis of all the orally administered drug, he's figured out a, a set of rules that a molecule should be in order to be a drug. And we call that the Lipinski rule of five. Okay, and so it's comprised of parameters, which I'm going to talk about in just a moment, like the number of hydrogen bond donor, acceptor, the, the molecule, size, it should be less than 500 Dalton, and also the solubility. But before going there, let's have a look at what is involved in order to discover a new drug. So these are the technology. The top portion here is going to be the chemist, the experimental, and also the theoretical part. The bottom part here will involve more into like the proteins, the structural biology aspect. So the combinatorial chemistry, that's like 
you have a large collection, a large collection of small molecular unit, which you could call it as a substructure, or you could call it as like a functional group. And then we have we are going bigger in size to be chemical libraries. So it could be anywhere between like 1 million or more. And chemical space is like if you enumerate, if you generate all possible chemical variant that exists in the entire world, that would be the chemical space. And so let's hop on down to the bottom part. We have machine learning, which is a IT like domain uh, topic that will allow scientists to learn from past data. So they could learn what is the important molecular feature by analyzing experimental data that scientists have obtained through experimental work. And so what they could do is they could figure out what is, what is the important molecular feature from the model interpretation. And there are other techniques like molecular modeling, like looking at the protein structure or other macromolecule and trying to figure out how they interact with one another, also through a complementary uh, technique called molecular docking. And because molecules are not static, meaning that they are in constant motion, therefore molecular dynamic is very instrumental because molecular dynamic allows you to look at how proteins move or molecules move in, in time, right? So. And so in order to do drug discovery work, we need some information. And so the information will be obtained from the following databases, Chambol, BindingDB, PubChem. And the information that we need is the bioactivity. And so that comes from the term biological activity. And so they are typically referring to the downstream effect that the binding of a molecule has on the target protein, right? So a molecule binds to the target protein and it induces some downstream biological activity. Like for example, we have the aromatase as a target protein and a molecule that can bind to it is called an inhibitor because it inhibits the function of the protein. And in molecular terminology, we call it we call it the protein ligand, right? And if we want to study the interaction, then we could call it protein ligand interaction. And so, as I already mentioned in the first few slides of the talk today, when a molecule or inhibitor binds to the target protein, it induces like the inhibition of the target protein, right? And then the malfunction or inhibition of the protein will cause a downstream effect. And so if the aromatase would normally go on to bind to another protein, but if you inhibit it, it could not go on to exert its downstream effect. And therefore that is why it will alter the metabolic pathway. And in doing so, it will influence the course of the disease. Okay. And so, Computational medicinal scientists will harness the biological activity data that are stored in the databases that are mentioned here in the slide, Chambol, BindingDB, and PubChem. So the important question is, what can computers do, right? There has been a lot of advancement in the realm of computer science, AI, machine learning, deep learning, and so computers can do many things, right? Like in the old days, we have IBM Deep Blue, which has been shown to defeat humans in Jeopardy and chess. Google has released self-driving car. We have Tesla now pioneering in that space. NASA are using computers to simulate space mission, right? Computers are being used by companies to design uh, aircrafts and car. Supermarkets and shopping malls are using AI to analyze uh, consumer shopping behavior and also 
they have a Amazon Fresh, right? Where you could go in, you could put grocery items in your shopping cart, and then you could just walk out of the store without going to the counter cashier and pay because every items that you have taken out from the shelf and put into your shopping cart are monitored with their cameras and their AI processing. Okay, so you're going to see that computers are now being used in practically every facet of our life. So these images, right, are generated by learning from it, like in via deep learning, and then they're transferring the style of the famous painting into a new photograph image. And the new photograph image will then look like the original painting in terms of the style. So deep learning is used to dream, right? Deep learning could also dream and it generated this, this image. And so now the question comes to be, why do we need computational models in drug discovery? So I have already mentioned that we, if we have a lot of biological activity data, we could harness that by performing what is known as the structure activity relationship study, where we take the chemical library and then we're aiming to understand what are the key molecular feature that allows molecule to have good or favorable biological activity. So typically in vitro data are limited and they're expensive and they are time consuming and laborious to obtain. Computational models on the other hand could be quickly built and they could be instrumental in predicting the pharmacokinetic or the AppNet property, as I mentioned, the absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion, toxicity. However, before a computational model could be built, we need some existing experimental data. And so it's kind of like asking the question, what came first, the chicken or the egg, right? So in order to build a good computational model, we need good experimental data. And so if we think of it, computational models are built from the existing data and therefore, it is good in filling in the dots, right? So if you have an initial, initial data from your experimental endeavor, but then you have some missing points, right? Like, like for example, if you have molecules A, B, C, D, and you have molecules, I mean, if you have protein A, B, C, D, and you have molecule one, two, three, four, and you wanna figure out what are the interactions between these four protein and four molecule. And let's say that you have done some experimental work, right? You have taken protein A to bind with molecule one and four, protein B to bind to molecules two and four, protein C to bind to molecules three and four, in, like in different combination but then you're going to have some gaps in the, in the experimental data. So you could use AI or machine learning to fill in the gap, okay? And so that will be extremely useful. But then with advancement in deep learning and AI, it is becoming possible to perhaps learn from the existing data that we have now and extrapolate that in order to make prediction for new molecule for a new protein. Okay, so I'm gonna show you how you could do that. Okay, so here are some of the questions that you could get answered from computational models. So for example, if you're coming from experimental wet lab, you might have questions like, what target protein could your compound bind to and modulate? Would your compound bind, bind unspecifically to other protein, which you call the off-target activity? Um, you, you could have questions like, what type of compounds will, can bind 
and can modulate the activity of your target protein of your interest. So if you have protein A, which compound are most likely to bind and inhibit that? Another could be, are there similar compounds to your query compound? Like for example, if you have a curcumin derivative and you're wondering, is there any other similar compound to that that could have similar binding activity? Or another question could be, how does your compound bind to the target protein of interest? And you could do that like using molecular docking. And if you want to look at it over time, you could use molecular dynamic. Another extremely important is how could you modify your existing compound structure in order to improve the pharmacokinetic or biological activity? So all of these questions can be answered by building a computational model. So if you're a bit skeptical about computational models, firstly, consider this. In 1998, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded to two computational chemists who developed the basis for quantum chemistry or quantum mechanics. And in 2013, the three scientists, Martin Karplis, Michael Levitt, and Ar Ariel Warshall, developed the basis for the study of biochemical system using molecular dynamics. Okay, so all of these scientists have opened up the gates for the use of computational approaches in the physical science, particularly in chemistry. And so in the next few years, you're, you're probably going to see more and more AI in use for drug discovery. And actually there, there have been some some release in the news that they've used deep learning in order to facilitate the repositioning of drug molecule, meaning that a drug molecule that has been originally proposed to cure disease A could also be used to cure disease B, right? And, and typically you, you could figure that out by performing further analysis as I mentioned that you might have already studied like for you have, you could have four protein and four molecule, right? Proteins A, B, C, D, molecule one, two, three, four. You might have taken your four molecule. No, actually, let's say that you, if you wanna take molecule one, you might have taken your molecule one and you have investigated the interaction between A, B, C, but then you haven't studied about D. Right, so in a future study, if deep learning or computational study could take molecule one that you have already proposed treatment for ABC, but it hasn't been tested with D, but if it was tested at a later point in time that it could bind effectively to D, then it could be also repurposed to treat the disease D as well. So you're gonna see that there's endless possibility here. Because if you haven't tested a molecule, whether it will bind to a protein of interest yet, it doesn't mean that it won't exert a biological activity, right? You could do that in a future point in time. Okay, so that therefore you're gonna see that there's a lot of things that you could do applying existing drug molecule, existing FDA approved molecule. And then you could do this thing called the drug repositioning taking an existing drug and testing it for a new protein that you're interested in, that is the target protein for the disease, and see whether the FDA-approved drug could inhibit the protein or not. And so therefore, that will allow you to kind of bypass the 10 years that is required for getting a drug to market, because you could get an existing drug that is already in the market to treat an to treat a new disease. And so let's take a high level look at the computational drug discovery. To the left, you're gonna see the resources. To the right, 
are also resources. On the top left-hand corner, there are concepts from medicinal chemistry, right? And this includes experimental approach like high throughput screening, high throughput synthesis, where you create the compound. And then you have figured it out by performing quantitative structure activity relationship. You have figured out what are the privileged structure Privileged structures are, let me show you again. Um, if this is a molecule, a substructure could be this. It could be this three molecules. This is a substructure. Let's say that this, from your analysis of 100 or, or 1,000 disease target protein, you have figured out that this particular substructure is responsible for curing 50 diseases. Therefore, we could say that this is a, this is a privileged substructure because it has been known to be highly effective in treating 50 diseases. So privileged substructure are those that are commonly found in the treatment of diseases. And so this could also be figured out doing computational analysis, right? And so as more and more experimental data are being accumulated, we need to do privileged structures. Okay, so I think this is a very interesting area to dig into because there's a lot of data in the Chambo database there's a lot of data in the various structure, protein structure database, like Protein Data Bank, um, in in Chambo, in PubChem. But the like figuring out what are all of the existing privileged substructure there are, and and if you could take that privileged substructure, and you know use it in the medicinal chemist study, I think you could be able to figure out more possible drug candidate in a quicker time. Other than that, there is a terminology called bioisostere and chemoisostere. Um, that's a very interesting topic in medicinal chemistry. And it predominantly means that how can you take a molecule and to what extent can you modify the molecule and it will still bind to the same target protein, right? So think like, like for example, if you wanna take, if you wanna modify this hydrogen atom, it's rather small. And if you modify it into other heavy atom, it might be too big to go into the binding cavity of a protein. So what you could do is you could replace a hydrogen atom right here, a hydrogen atom with a halogen atom, like chlorine or bromine, because they're rather small. They are electronegative atom, which is rather small. And the size is roughly the same as the hydrogen atom at about like one angstrom. So that's the, if I remember correctly, I think it's the bioisostere. It means that how can you modify the, the chemical compound, but still maintain the biological activity, right? So that is the essence of medicinal chemistry, right? You generate hundreds or thousands of variants of the lead molecule and still have the same biological activity. But the chemoisostere is different. You're taking a look at it at a different way. Chemoisostere is when you have a, a molecule that you want to bind to multiple target protein, right? You, like, for example, a lot of the scientists are saying like natural products like curcumin are able to bind to like hundreds of different target protein, right? I mean, it, it could be due to it does interact well, or it could be that it is a pan, a uh, pain. P-A-I-N, it is a pan-assay interference, uh, meaning that it is an artifact of the experimental 
um, endeavor. And so that has yet to be uh, illuminated in further detail. Um, another very important thing is scaffold hopping. And typically scaffold hopping is where you take the, you're not focusing on the functional group, but then you're focusing on the core structure. And typically scaffold hopping is kind of like used to, it could be used to escape the IP, like the in intellectual property, where you change the, the scaffold, right? The, the core structure, but then you're you're maintaining the dynamic of the interaction. You're maintaining the functional group at R1, R2, R3 to be at the same position, but then you're changing only the core structure. Okay, so knowledge of all of these will help you to design a, a very effective drug. Um, as you can see, it, it might take, I think it could take an entire semester to learn about all of these um, topic. Or, or you could also like read further information by performing some literature review and reading re review articles on the topics that are mentioned in this particular slide. And if you look at the bottom, I provided a reference or citation to the paper that I've written in 2015. And it's taking a look at the high, high level at how you could harness all of these information in order to have an effective drug discovery project, right? And so you, you see it to the left here, you have the databases, right? For a small molecule, right? Like the, the smile notation, like how does the molecule like are connected? Um, you have the protein databases, like protein data bank. You have the protein protein interaction database. You also have the metabolic pathway um, database as well. At the center part here, we're gonna take a look at the concepts that are rele relevant for drug discovery in terms of the size of the molecular system, right? If you're taking a look at the smallest unit, you have the fragment based. And so fragment is like uh, I have shown here. In this molecule, a fragment is right here, the substructure. These are the fragments. Okay. And, you know, like in fragment based docking, what they do is they take this fragment and they, they dock to the protein. And they could take another fragment here and dock to the protein. So that is fragment based studies. And then you have ligand based, meaning you take the, the molecule. The molecule are called ligand. Okay. So if you take a library of molecule, small molecule, you could perform QSAR analysis, QSAR, quantitative structure activity relationship. You could do admit property screening. If you take a look at the protein level, you could do several things, right? You could do molecular modeling using PIMO, looking at the 3D structure of the protein. You could do pr protein structure prediction homology and app initio. And nowadays they have the alpha fold two uh, from open AI, which has been released and has been effective in figuring out like the entire proteome of humans and beyond. And the alpha fold two database has been released. So it's a rather big step for computational drug discovery. And for those who have the computer hardware, I highly recommend to look into AlphaFold 2, where you could potentially do pre-docking of all compounds in the databases mentioned to the left. Um, I've included in the, the arrows on how you could make use of the database, how you could make use of the medicine of chemistry, how you could make use of the cheminformatic approach, the bioinformatic and the chemogenomic approach to which system. Okay, so all of these could be like used kind of like in a flow chart manner um, at the same time. And it really depends on your research laboratory, which of the tools and the toolbox that you have access to. So some research lab might only have high throughput screening. Some research lab might do low throughput screening. Some might do only computational work. So as you're gonna see here, in order to do everything here, it requires either a big laboratory 
or a good collaboration, research collaboration. And so with good research collaboration, you could do complementary work. So I've, I've given kind of like a big high level look. And here we're gonna take a look at the terminologies of bioinformatic. And if you take a look at it, the, bio, the term bioinformatic has two components, right? You have the bio and you have the informatic. So informatic, you, you're making use of computational approaches. And bio, as in biology, info, as in information. So you're going to generate a lot of biological information. And afterward, we're going to analyze all of that, right, in order to once you have analyzed it, you could compare it, right? Between the different genes, you could compare genes and, and molecule, you could compare uh, proteins and molecule, proteins and protein. And as I mentioned in the prior slide, there's several databases that allows you to compare uh, the possibilities in terms of the sequence, right? If you wanna know whether two genes are similar, two proteins are similar, you could compare in terms of the sequence, or you could compare in terms of the protein structure. You could align it, right? Take, taking two molecules, putting it on top of one another and see how the, the backbone structure of the molecule of the protein are similar and how do, are they differ. Another could be using programs like uh, Cytoscape in order to explore the the, the big spider web of metabolic pathway. And so all of this interaction using biological information is under the umbrella of bioinformatic. Cheminformatic, on the other hand, is quite similar, but then instead of biology, you're plugging in the chemistry, right? So it's everything related to analyzing chemistry, chemical compound. And so some popular terminology here includes the chemical space, like the chemical universe. So to the right here, you're gonna see that it is a, a snapshot of a chemical library. So you're gonna see that there's so many molecules here and it represents a small chemical space um, that they're studying. Okay, and there's the molecular descriptor, which are used to describe in quantitative terms the physical chemical property of a molecule. Like for example, how big or heavy they are in terms of the molecular weight, how well are they soluble in aqueous solution, water, um, in organic solution. And so that's uh, measured by log P. And we also have the number of hydrogen bond donor and acceptor. And these four parameters are used in the Lipinski rule of five. So I think we're gonna talk about that in, in a future slide. Okay, so I me mentioned briefly about the different sizes of the molecule in the slide here in the middle, we have fragment ligand structure system. And then we have some more, you know, like definitions here. So yeah, I'll, I'll let you read it, but in a nutshell, fragment is the smallest unit of a molecule. Like you take a molecule, you, you dissemble it, you get the fragments. You dissemble more, you get another fragment, okay? Privileged substructure, as I mentioned, the fragments that has been found to possess several um, effectiveness against several tar therapeutic targets are called the privileged substructure. So if you Google this, I think you're gonna find some interesting uh, re review article like for example, what are the privileged substructure for breast cancer, right? And, and then they're gonna talk about like, for example, like acyl group would be essential because it binds to the heme, um, heme, heme part of the binding cavity of the aromatase, right? So, so it really depends on the target protein. Um, and the privileged substructure, as I mentioned, if protein target protein share similar binding cavity, it should also share similar inhibiting compound. Like for example, you have the collection of proteins in the family, 
in the protein family of um, cytochrome P450. Okay. So if a molecule that is an antifungal could inhibit the, it's shown to inhibit the cytochrome P450, and you have an aromatase enzyme, which is important for breast cancer. Therefore, you could reposition a antifungal agent to be a anti-breast cancer drug based on the fact that they share the same target protein functionality in that they are in the same P450 family and they have the heme group right? They have the ASO moiety, A-Z-O-L-E, A -Z -O -L -E, to bind to the, the heme portion of the cavity. And therefore, actually, scientists have found that they they're, they're able to reposition some of the um, ASO molecule to be potential candidate for treating breast cancer. Okay, so if you know the details like that, you could easily figure out which molecule to test in your experimental um, design, or also by reading the privileged substructure in the review articles. Uh, lead and also lead optimization, as I've already mentioned, is kind of like taking the hit molecule and improving upon that, in, um, like creating hundreds of variants as to improve the admit property, and also to find better drug than the one that is the hit, right? So you, it's like, you're gonna take the hit, but then you, you're gonna make a better version of it. Drugs could then be obtained through rigorous um, preclinical and clinical trials. And so this will take several years before it reaches the market. But as I've already mentioned, if you're able to do drug repositioning, you could greatly reduce the amount of time uh, there because you're, you're taking an existing drug to the market, but actually to a different um, target protein, but they are already in the market. Okay, so let's have a look at identifying hits. And so typically you could do that experimentally using high throughput screening. And there's also a computational approach as well. So you're taking a big chemical library and then you're testing it against the same target protein. Okay, so that's the high throughput screening. And you have a micro titer plate where you have several wells and then each well will have different compound, but then the same uh, target protein. And then you put it into the machine that's shown here in the image. And here you want to find similar compounds that exert biological activity and if you take a look at the conceptual approach, I mean, in terms of the illustration here, you're taking a target and the ligand to have the interaction. Lead generation, hit to lead. So, so there are some examples to the right side here. And so the identified hits from high throughput screen could then be transformed and, and improved upon um, by performing lead optimization. And therefore that is done by altering the chemical structure um, in doing so, you're also altering the and also optimizing the admit property. So it means that you're you're adding additional functional groups to it, like from molecule one to two, and then you're adding more additional functional group to it to become molecule three. So you're going to see that the size of the molecule gets bigger as you add more substructure to it, but then the admit property also improves. But it comes at the cost of bigger molecule. Um, likewise, for the tuberculosis target as well, um, going from four to five to six, right? So you're going to see that the IC50 decreases. So there is an improvement in the biological activity. And you're going to see that the size increases uh, ever so more. So it's more or less kind of like a Lego building block, um, colored coded here in blue and red and in black color. Right, and it, when you're adding more functional group to it, it gets bigger and bigger, right? You're going from nine to 16 to 27 to 33, right? And in doing so, you, you're also improving the, the potency. If you look at the IC50, it, it, uh, it is also improving, right? The number is becoming smaller and smaller, meaning that you're using less 
amount of the drug in order to exert 50% inhibition. A larger number means you, you need more of the drug to in, it, it elicit 50% inhibition. So using less and getting the same bioactivity means a more potent drug. And if you take a look at it in a visual way, there are millions or billions of possibility and you want to narrow it down. And also if you take a look at the, the funnel here, the size could start from being a small fragment to becoming a small molecule to becoming a bigger molecule and a bigger molecule. But the thing is, it's kind of like you're taking fragments and then you're, you're piecing it together. You're combining it together in order to get a, a molecule, a bigger molecule. And in order to improve the potency or the admit property, you're adding another substructure to it. So it becomes a, a bit bigger. But the thing is, you don't want it to be too big. Because if, if it's too big, it could not pass through the blood band barrier. I mean, the, the solubility, will, will it will come at the cost of the solubility as well. Okay, so there's a lot of, therefore they call it like the multi-objective optimization, right? You want the good activity, but you don't want it to be too big. And how can you optimize that? It's also similar to how you could get to places from point A to point B. Like you could get, you could go by driving, by walking, by motorcycling, right? There's so many ways and different paths, but which path is the most optimal, right? So that you have to figure out. And therefore research is therefore an art form. You know, there is no exact path that you could do, you could take. There's thousands or millions of possibility. And it really depends on the, the, the tool that you have, the technology, and also the experience. So it is therefore an art form. So here's the Lipinski Rule 5. So I mentioned already also that he's analyzed a collection of orally administered drug, and then he formulated the rule of five. And so that this includes having a molecule having the following parameter are called drug-like molecule. So if the molecule is less than 500 Dalton, if it have a lipophilicity or log P less than five, if the hydrogen bond donor is less than five and the hydrogen bond donor acceptor is less than 10, then you call it a drug-like molecule. And so these findings here is actually published already in the RSC advances um, in our research group back in 2017. And so we did the Lipinski Rule 5 um, analysis by taking a set of molecule <clears throat> and then looking at the, uh, the Rule 5 parameter. And the red line that you see, the vertical red line is the cutoff, right? Like less than 500. So you're gonna see that the majority of molecule are abiding through the Rule 5, but then there are some parameter um, that might exceed in terms of the log P. You're going to see that like roughly 40, 30 to 40% are exceeding the value. And the molecular weights, about like 20% are exceeding the value. But for the hydrogen bond donor and acceptor, you're going to see that they all are less than the recommended. Right? You're going to see that the log P is exceeding, molecular weight is exceeding. And so as you can see that it's extremely difficult to have all FDA approved drugs to abide by the rule of five. Because the thing is, to be an effective drug, it might violate some rule. Right? So we, we performed that kind of analysis in this study like as much as two parameter that you could violate and still be a good drug. That is our finding uh, for this breast cancer target. All right, so there's also another um, kind of like in improvising the rule of five to the lead like rule of three that a fragment should have less than 300 Dalton. Like the, the lead molecule should have the following rule. Like, because the thing is, if you have a look here, a lead molecule is of moderate size. And before a lead could become a drug, the size will be bigger. Right? So you don't want the lead to be big. You want it to, to be moderately big so that you can add additional functional group to it. Right? So the lead should not be too big. Otherwise, if you add additional groups to it, it will be too big to, um, it, it will surpass the rule of five by a lot. Okay, and everything is in multiple of three, less than 300, less than three. And so I re reiterated this several times that chemical space or chemical universe is kind of like the possibility of all variants. Or if you think of it, it's kind of like the diversity of the com chemical compound, right? If you look at the geography, you could think of a map as kind of like a chemical space, right? You have a, you have a map of the entire country of the world. And here you have a map of the chemical space, right? 
All right, so here we have the biological space. If you think of it as kind of like a box here, the biological space of the entire here, um, let me show you. Yeah, so it's represented in yellow, right? So the, you have different target protein. Um, the sphere will represent the biological space of the different proteins. And you're going to see that some are overlapping while though some are like kind of like an outlier. Okay? Because different protein could have different feature while a similar protein family could have similar feature and if they are similar then they will be located closer to one another and if they are located closer to one another it means that there's a high chance that you could perform drug repositioning right where you it could share the inhibiting compound and therefore you could do drug repositioning and then you have the fragment space right you're put, putting the chemical fragment into the data visualization here and then you're going to have a look at how they are distributed in the fragment universe so as i mentioned already the raymond group has created computationally molecules based on 10 atoms or i mean 13 atoms and 17 atoms and creating virtual compounds Okay, so here they're doing kind of like a, a branching out of all of the chemical scaffold here, and they're adding different functional group to the molecule, and it will become bigger and bigger. Um, but in a nutshell, they are belonging to three different uh, scaffolds. Okay, so as I've mentioned already, you're starting out from having a fragment, and then several fragment will then become kind of like a hit molecule, right? So your 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 hit molecule could is essentially comprised of several fragments in here. Like here, you have the amine, you have the carbonyl atom, you have the hydroxy atom here. Um, so they are a combination of fragments, and therefore the lead should not be too big, as mentioned here, like approximately less than three hundred or roughly at that range. And when you're optimizing it through lead optimization, the molecule will, will become slightly bigger and bigger. And therefore, your optimal space will be shown at the circle shown at the far right-hand corner here, roughly about 500 Dalton and roughly at about 5 uh, log P. Okay, so here is an example of the polypharmacology. Okay, so as I mentioned already that the protein family like cytochrome P450 it has like hundreds of members that share the heme atom, uh, the heme group in the binding cavity. Uh, and this is the case for the example here, the kinase. The kinases also have the heme group in the binding cavity. Now, in doing so, there are hundreds of members in here, and the, the, the molecule called starosporine shares binding to several of the protein family in the cytochrome P450. So you can see here that the starosporine could bind to SYK, ITK, PIM1, all of the protein mentioned in here. And therefore, it, it is called the polypharmacology. Okay, this is the desirable off-target binding. It means that the molecule could bind to multiple target protein, and it is off-target meaning that it does not bind specifically to one, okay? So one molecule does not bind to one protein, but it binds to like 10. And therefore, you call this polypharmacology. But if your molecule binds undesirably to other protein, you call it off-target, or sometimes you could call it side effects, right? So all drugs will have off-target and also side effects as well. But it only depends on like to what extent. Is the side effect acceptable? Is the side effect, um, is it toxic? Is it dangerous, right? Like, for example, we have the we have the, the allergy, right? When like, there's the chlor chlorphenolamine, right? The, the antihistamine, it has side effects. It does have side effects in the sense that it makes you drowsy. Right, you might get sore throat, you might get like dry throat, but it has its, its effect, right, in reducing the allergy. Okay, so that is okay, right? So it really depends on whether the off target is desirable or um, too undesirable. If, if it's not too much, then it is still acceptable. And so the concept of polypharmacology here is very important for, for those who want to have a molecule that is multi-target, right? Like you might have a dual target inhibitor, right? You, you might want a molecule to inhibit to two proteins or, or more. It really depends on the, the study. And so how can you leverage the polypharmacology for drug discovery? Well, there is this thing called the drug repositioning 
and I briefly mentioned to you already that if proteins share similar binding cavity, they are also most likely to share the same inhibitor. And if they do, if the inhibitor has been already proposed to treat disease A, it could also possibly be used to treat disease B, owing to the fact that they share the same binding cavity, meaning that the target protein looks quite quite similar. And therefore, if the drug could inhibit A and it could also inhibit B as well. So that is drug repositioning or repurposing, meaning that you're changing the label from being a treatment for disease A to also being a treatment for disease B as well. And so you can see that you could you could take the drug discovery effort ever more right, by figuring out a new treatment for an existing drug. And as mentioned already, you know, like during the clinical trials, the focus was on whether drug one is effective in inhibiting target protein A. And that is the sole focus of the study, right? They might not be interested in whether it binds to protein A015 because it's outside of their focus, right? But if in the future, someone, a scientist figures out that it also binds to A015 protein, and that protein is responsible for disease B, Therefore, why not, right? Why not reposition it? And if you figure that out, then it could be a treatment for disease B. So it's a low investment, but a high return if you could uh, find a new drug for the disease. Um, I mentioned already about the structure activity relationship study. And what it essentially is, is if you take a look at the dots here, um, the blue color and the red color, each point represents a molecule. And the molecule could have slightly different structure. And so the goal in the QSAR, quantitative structure activity relationship, is to find kind of like an equation that could describe what feature of the molecule is responsible for the observed activity. And so it wants to find a relationship between the structure and the activity, right? How, how does the structure alter or modulate activity? And after you have done so and make the prediction, then you want to compare, right, between the the experimental activity and the predicted activity. And if you get a, a linear line like that, it means that the experiment and the predicted value are in closed agreement. As mentioned already with the example here, this is a molecule and each of the group here are the functional group, the functional group, right? You have the NH2, NH3 here, you have the OH here, right? You have the carbonyl, you have the carbonyl here, C double bond O, so that's this image in 3D. And so we were aiming to study, right? Like if we change this to from OH to NH, what happened? If we take change this to OH, what happened? Kind of like make a point, like if the structure changes to all possible combination, what is the biological activity? And then analyze that information and then try to to formulate a pattern like if you change these two position it is detrimental to the biological activity however if you make this more um, electronegative it will have better activity and once you have that then you, you will have more understanding to design the drug right and so this is an example in a three three step manner you have the you want to select a biological activity of your interest for example breast cancer inhibition breast cancer um aromatase inhibition. You want to inhibit the aromatase enzyme. Uh, number two is you want to generate the physical chemical descriptor of the molecule. And for that, you use the computational chemistry. Afterward, you want to find the relationship between the physical chemical description shown in the table below, right? You have the QM energy, um, the micro, which is the dipole moment. You have the homolumo energy, energy of the molecular orbital, and also the gap. Now you're going to see that each molecule will have different um, parameter value. And then the you have the orange arrow at the far right here, um, which will essentially mean that the model will allow you to predict the activity based on the molecular descriptor. Okay, so you might have like an equation like IC50 equal to QM plus energy plus micro plus homo plus lumo plus homolumo gap. But you also have to add like the, uh, the coefficient to it. Like what is the magnitude of each of the variables? 
example, right? So it is a multi-linear regression. And once you have formulated the linear regression, you will be able to figure out what is the magnitude and the magnitude will tell you the importance of the variable. And in order to find the relationship between the, the descriptor or the structure and the activity, you use the machine learning to do that and where you build a machine learning model, right? So there are an increasing usage of the QSAR um, approach for investigating the structure activity relationship. And so this is a typical workflow if you're if you're interested in doing a quantitative structure activity relationship. And it, in, it involves, you know, like data collection and preparation, curation. So that will be the left-hand side here. And to the right-hand side, once you have collected a clean data, because the thing is 80% of your effort will go into collecting and processing and curating your data. And so the the remaining 20% will be on building the model and then um, figuring out which feature are important. So some benefit and application of QSAR um, has been used by the EPA, um, OECD, for the identification of molecules that are potentially toxic. Okay, so it's, it, it's, it is being used as an alternative to animal testing. Like for example, if there is a new um, molecule that has been synthesized, they will run it through the QSAR model in order to determine whether they are toxic or potentially uh, dangerous or not. Um, and, and this is essential for the regulatory use because some molecules you could never, you know, import if you're if you're doing research. Um, some molecule might need additional uh, security clearance because it might be toxic. And so how, how can you determine that for a new molecule? Um, they use the QSAR model. As I've shown you, um, earlier part of the slide, QSAR is very in instrumental and important for understanding the intricate structure activity relationship. And it is also very important also for material design, like designing molecule that could be used as like uh, energy emitting molecules or um, for industrial usage as well. So, th so these are just an example of what we have done um, in my previous career as a researcher, academic professor. Um, we've used it to investigate, you know, like the structure activity relationship of several proteins and also several molecule as well. We've also developed some software called Autoweka and PyGOS. So Autoweka was an automated data mining software. Um, we actually actually developed that very far back in like I think 2000 and 2000. 2007, we've released the Auto Beaker, um, and, and we've also writ written a book chapter about that. So that was like in a time where um, there weren't very there weren't very much um, resources available for machine learning. And nowadays, we have a lot of auto ML, uh, automatic machine learning. So yeah, so these are based from our review article back in 2009 um, on some of the biological and chemical properties that you could use to make predictions and investigate the structure activity relationship or structure property relationship. And they are summarized in the table here. Let's see. Okay. Okay, um, actually we have one more slide and then I'm going to give you some case study. Um, and then I'm, I think we might have time to do a demo uh, showing some uh, use case of the QSAR in action. So I've also just shared just a moment ago on social media on Twitter, uh, posted the link to this particular uh, live stream uh, if anyone is interested to join us. Let me make it full screen. Okay, <clears throat> so here we have the concept of QSAR, uh, which we have talked about for the most part of this presentation. And we have also mentioned something about polypharmacology. Um, and here, following two terms here to the left and to the right are the computational approach of how you could do that um, using machine learning. So to the left, you have a single target protein that you are interested in. For example, if you want to treat breast cancer, you have the aromatase enzyme. Um, colored in blue color, single target protein. And then you have multiple compounds to the left. You have the three, the, the five different uh, triangle in orange color. So in that study, you want to investigate whether the five molecule, the orange molecule, whether they could bind effectively to the blue molecule shown there. So you're investigating 
several molecules to a single target protein. And this is called the QSAR or the quantitative structure activity relationship. To the right, you want to do a many to many um, investigation where you have multiple protein and you have multiple compound and you want to see how they are in interacting with one another in a in all possible combination. So you're going to see that we're expanding upon Q, QSAR to become many to many relationship. Before we have many to one, now we have many to many. And so in a practical situation, you know, like um, in a typical research study um, and an experimental research study, for eco economical reason, a typical research lab could be investigating only using one target protein against like maybe a hundred small molecule. But that is theoretically or experimentally small. But in the real world where in an actual setting, breast cancer doesn't involve only one target protein. It is in a situation where it involves several target proteins and the target protein could interact with one another. And in that big mixture of possibility, you know, doing the traditional single protein approach is too simplistic. In a practical setting, in an actual setting, the proteochemo metric allows you to investigate several target protein and several compound at the same time. And the, the concept of proteochemo metric was formulated by Professor Joel Wickberg from Uppsala University. Uh, he has retired from Uppsala University. Um, I think in, back in 2012, yeah, we collaborated. Um, he, he came to Thailand, I think it was like 2011 uh, to be a, like a member for an examination of one of my uh, PhD students who I co-supervised. And in 2012, we applied together for an international research grant. Um, and then we got funding from the Swedish Research Council. Um, and that funding allowed us to organize an international conference on pharmaceutical bioinformatics in 2016 um, in Pattaya, um, in Centara Grand. Uh, where 200 scientists from all over the world came. Uh, there were from Cambridge University, from Imperial College, from Chambo. Uh, yeah, so several, several eminent uh, researchers came. John Overington, Anne Hershey, um, Professor uh, Matthew Pock Leeson. Um, there, there, there's so many, and, and also the, the founder of the Keck database as well. Yeah, so protein metric allows you to investigate multiple proteins and multiple compounds. So let's take a look at the, some of the applications of the QSAR or quantitative structure activity relationship or quantitative structure property relationship. So this, is, this was actually the first project that I was involved with when I was doing my PhD study. So I was fascinated by the green fluorescent protein and they are the proteins that are responsible for the fluorescence of the jellyfish. And in 2008, three scientists were awarded the Nobel Prize for their discovery of this very useful fluorescent protein. And nowadays they are being used as kind of like a fluorescent biomarker, uh, fluorescent marker uh, for tagging proteins, looking at hey, how they localize or how they traffic uh, through the uh, various bio biological systems. It's kind of like a highlighter, like a color dye. So what I wanted to do back then, I think it was like 2006, 2005, uh, what I've done was I've collected a set of chromophore uh, shown here at the middle. If you take a look at the blue color, um, the chromophore is responsible for the color of the fluorescent protein. And the chromophore 
are structurally diverse. They are slightly different. If you take a look at the chromophore, you can see that they are based on the serine 65, tyrosine 66, glycine 67. And they form through post-translational modification, a chromophore that will illuminate different color depending on the structure. Some are green, some are blue, some are uh, purple, uh, some are red, orange, yellow. So different depending on the chromophore. So what I wanted to do back then was to figure out how the structure give rise to the different color. So I've collected a set of chromophore and then I built a machine learning model. And so for each chromophore, I've described it by, by in terms of the quantum mechanical descriptor. And then I've utilized um, machine learning algorithms like artificial neural network, support vector machine, partially squares regression, multiple linear regression to build a model that will explain the underlying phenomenon that gives rise to the color. So that was for the first time. Uh, prior to that, no one has collected a big data set of the fluorescent protein. And we, we were happy to be one of the first. And at the time when I was doing it, I was fairly new to machine learning. So a lot of the effort was very manual, a lot of manual co collection into a, a Microsoft Excel. And at the time, I, I didn't know programming. So um, did most of the machine learning model building using a graphical software called Wika. And then after that, yeah, I started to embrace more into uh, coding and Python. So Roger Sian was awarded, was one of the Nobel laureate, and he developed this very useful um, image here that you could see. You can see that there are very different spectrum in a rainbow color of the possible fluorescent protein. So he discovered how you could, you know, like modify the chromophore in order to get the different color. And what I've done was to take all of the available variants of the chromophore and build a machine learning model out of that. So that might be useful for creating a fluorescent protein with a desirable, like a specific laser sharp um, wavelength. Because if you could control the emission or the excitation of the um, of the chromophore, you'll be able to use several fluorescent protein together in the same experiment as shown here. Right? You could tag like ten or twenty different protein, and and they might not interfere with one another. But they're but but you know practically it would interfere because the excitation and emission have overlapping regions. And so that work was published in 2005 in the Journal of Computational Chemistry. And then we went on to do a part two and a part three uh, of the study using the data that we've collected. And in, in the latest paper that you're going to see below here, um, I've used the proteochemometric approach where we consider the environmental um, aspects to the chromophore. And we considered that in the, in the computational work. And papers one and two are only based on the chromophore. So we only describe the chromophore, like the chemical aspect. So we extracted the chromophore from the protein structure, and then we build a model uh, using machine learning. Uh, but then in the third paper here, we've also considered what is the environmental residue that are around the chromophore. Uh, and those residues that are near the chromophore could interact with the chromophore, and we considered that in our computational model. So if you take a look at it in a in a high level way, uh, this is shown using the proteochemometric approach. So what we have here is at the par top part are the data set. So we have information on the chromophore, which is the first part. So you, you can see on the far left. And then we have the mutational information on the surrounding amino acid. And so the, the blue colored parts are the X descriptor. So we're gonna use that as input to the machine learning model. And then the spectral property will be the Y descriptor. So we're gonna predict that. Okay, so the chromophore is comprised of the nine quantum mechanical descriptor. And the mutational information is based on the 
uh, Z scale descriptor of the amino acid. And the rationale for using it is, you know, described in the Sandberg paper of 1998. And essentially, Z scale descriptor is a compact way. It was obtained from principal component analysis. So it, it kind of like, if you think of it, the C scale will, will compress the information about the amino acid, like based on hundreds of descriptor into only five descriptor. Um, so in a nutshell, what we have built here is a machine learning model based on proteochemometric approach. And we described using the chromophore information and also the surrounding amino acid information in order to predict the excitation or the emission. Okay, so the emission is the color that you see. The excitation is the wavelength that is used to induce the protein to emit the color. Like for, for a typical situation, if you want the green color here, you want the protein to emit green color like here, you need to shine a blue color to it or ultraviolet color. And, and the fluorescent protein will accept the energy, the photon of light from the blue color wavelength, and it will translate that into blue uh, into green color, right? So it has a specific excitation maxima that is required in order to generate the emission maxima. And so what we did was we predicted the the wavelength that is required to excite the protein. And also we predicted the wavelength that is that the chromophore will be releasing. So all of this is predicted using machine learning. And so if you take a look at this uh, image, it's also from our paper. Um, it, it shows you how the surrounding amino acids are located uh, near the chromophore. And looking at the protein sequence in panel B, and panel C is the chromophore that was extracted from the fluorescent protein. So what, what we did was we cut off the peptide bonds to the left and to the right of the chromophore in order to have it like as a small molecule. So this is a, a molecular model of the chromophore and also with the surrounding um, so SHG, SYG are the chromophore. GYG is the, also the chromophore. SWG is also the chromophore. So you're gonna see that it has the same, you know, S and G to the left and to the right. It's serine because it has like small um, functional group. And to the middle, middle is an aromatic. Uh, the middle will be either a tyrosine, histidine, uh, tryptophan, Okay, so like we generated some uh, proteochemometric models using different combination of descriptor permutation, and we got pretty promising results, as you can see here. And then we have several different models. And, you know, looking at all of the different models, we were able to uh, derive at the best one. But I'm not going to provide, uh, I'm not going to go into detail here. So in summary, um, QSAR or quantitative structure activity relationship model allows you to understand how changes to the structure of a molecule will lead to the resulting property change. And machine learning is instrumental in learning from the data of the available, you know, like how does the structure looks like and what is the resulting bioactivity. And based up on this collective data set, we use and apply machine learning to make sense of that. So I think now it's time for showing you some example of how we could take this a step further. Okay, like typically when we publish this, you know, like back in 2006 and also in 2012 or 13, most of the findings that we publish is in the paper, right? So the result is in the form of a figure, static image. It could be in the form of a tabular data like this. But at you as the reader, 
how can you make use of this data, which is published? You could use, make use of it by reading about it, by reading about the dis discussion and what was the important descriptor. But you know, to make, to make use of it in a practical setting, let's say that you want to reproduce this work. Okay, I could share the data, I could share the code, which we have done. We've shared the data, we've shared the code. But then the thing is, the user will need to have technical knowledge of the data sets. And I also have, I mean, technical knowledge of how to provision and also the, the necessary hardware to compute the descriptor, to perform an post analysis, um, to perform curation, preparation of the data that we've done. And, you know, like before we could actually make this model, it would have taken maybe six to seven months. And prior to that, it would have taken us like 10 years to uh, become proficient in what we were doing. Um, but then for those who are newcomers to the field, in order to make use of it, they might have to reproduce our efforts, which I think is not so optimal, right? It would have been better if they could just continue from where we left off, you know? And, and that's why, you know, de deploying, you know, like taking your machine learning model to the next step. Uh, I remember that one of my research students, uh, one of my ma uh, master's students, he mentioned about having a machine learning model like that to be living. So he he actually called it the living QSAR model. Um, in back in 2009, I think, you know, like reproducible models hasn't really been, you know, popular. You know, people are reluctant to share their code. Uh, uh, better yet, they they don't they also haven't really deployed it as a web application that other people could freely use. Um, yeah, I actually met a professor, um, Dr. Brown, I think it's Chris Brown or Titus Brown, uh, from the University of Michigan or Michigan State University. When he went, he came to Thailand and he gave a talk. Uh, we have some discussion about like open research and research reproducibility. And so after that, that discussion, you know, like I made all of the code and data of our research group to be freely available on GitHub. And so we wanted to allow other researchers to make use of that uh, work. So, I mean, we, we don't really care that you're going to, you're, you're going to make up, you know, the, uh, in terms of the credit, because we, we just wanted to, you know, give it forward. Um, if other researchers could make better use of it, that would be like, Will, will feel so much better than it just being published and you know well, wasting space on the shelf. So we shared the code and data, and not until recently, you know, like in late um, approaching 2020, maybe not 2018 or so, um, we used one of the early web framework um, in R, which is called the R Shiny. And then recently, there's the in 2018, 2019, there's a Python library uh, called Trimlet, um, which I've used. And you know, fast forward to today, I, I joined um, Streamlit, and which is now part of Snowflake. And I'm on the Streamlit team, and I'm doing education part. Like I, I'm, I'm creating tutorial. I'm creating video uh, tutorial uh, blog posts to show users how they could use Streamlit for their various use cases, um, particularly in the biological domain, biomedical domain. I think there's a lot of potential uh, use cases that scientists aren't aware of at the moment. And that you, you, could ex you could take your research to the next level just by converting your machine learning model into a web application. And imagine that user could interact with your model, right? Imagine they could interact with this particular image. They could rotate the molecule, right? There are some uh, Streamlit creators who has developed a component that allows you to, you know, more rotate the molecule, which I'll, I'm going to show you right now, actually. Let me see. Um, let me show the screen.
Okay. Yeah. So Jose Manuel Nepos, Dorothy, uh, he's written this streamlit components and he calls it the STMO. And this is what you could do with it. This is an example. Right, you could you could load the data into a web app here. You could use you, you could see the molecule and it's done online. So nothing for you to install. You know, that, that's like the I think it's the future of research in general, is that you know, like there's no need to set up your environment in order to do research. You have access to the model on the fly, on demand. Right, like in the old days, like if you want to watch a movie or if you want to watch a TV series, you have to pop in the DVD, right? But nowadays you could just go to Netflix and several other uh, provider and you could stream the, the, the movie or the, the TV series into your computer or um, tablet. Same thing here, you can make your machine learning model available on the fly. You don't need to set up you know, the environment. You could just access the model directly. And so actually I'm writing a book chapter about that, about how you could make use of Streamlit to build bioinformatic tools. So yeah, you, you could expect for a book chapter to be available probably um, at the end of the year or early next year. But in the meantime, I'll also write some blog posts as well. Um, I could show you a work in progress that I'm working on. It's called QSAR 101. I have named it QSAR 101. And it's a work in progress, meaning that it's not yet you know, production ready. So I'm collaborating with a researcher um, at Mahidol University, a faculty of medicine over at Rama Tibidi. And this particular app will be able to accept the smile notation. So let me show you. I click here, example input. I'm going to get this smiles here and you know, it will allow me to also visualize the molecule. Right here. This is the input molecule here. And I'll be able to have the, the underlying molecular structure. And this is done directly in the web app. And I get the descriptor. I get the computed molecular descriptor. And so the next step for this app is I'm going to apply, uh, I'm going to build a machine learning model and allow user to put in their molecule. And then the user will be able to predict the biological activity based on the input molecule. And probably I could add some more additional uh, data visualization into it, like adding uh, what is the computed Lipinski rule of five. Okay, so you could see whether the molecule that you are interested in, for example, if in your research lab, if you're synthesizing a unique molecule, you could put in your smile notation of the molecule, right? And then it will be used as input to the to the web application and the web application will consider your molecule and make a prediction whether your molecule could potentially inhibit target protein A, B, C. Um, so the possibility is endless. You could, you could build your own web application that perform additional analysis if you like. Let me show you what it looks like, the code. So I share all of my code here on GitHub. So there's several folder here. All right, so yeah, this is the, the repository of the code and the information is all here in the Streamlit app. Okay, so this is the code for the Streamlit app and you're gonna see that we're, we're using the already kits uh, Python library and we're using PaddlePy for calculating the descriptor. All right. So here we're using some of the Python libraries here. And as you can see, um, all of the, the things that you can see in the app here is a little over a hundred lines of code here. 
head over back to the presentation slide. All right, so in summary, you, you have seen that QSAR models has been very uh, useful for allowing us to investigate the structure activity uh, relationship. And PCM models also allows you to consider, in addition to a single protein, you could consider many proteins at the same time. And that will allow you to do some interesting work like drug repositioning. So that would take us a step further into um, developing a new drug in a shorter period of time. And you ha have also seen some of the benefits of um, performing quantitative structure activity relationship, particularly by allowing you to understand the important molecular feature of the um, models from the predictive uh, modeling using machine learning. Yeah, proteochemometric, as I've mentioned, it was developed back in 2001. Um, and yeah, 2012, I collaborated with Professor Joel Wigberg, visited Uppsala University a couple of times. And currently, the lab is run now by Professor Ola Spiutz, who's also doing work in the pharmaceutical bioinformatic realm as well. And so it is without a doubt that the quantitative structure activity relationship has a lot of uh, potential benefits, but also there are several points that you should consider when using the technology. Um, one of the, uh, the thing is that there's obviously going to be a lot of high dimensionality of the information that you have to consider. Um, but then given that if you could effectively handle the intricate complexity, then it will allow you to, to apply this for more beneficial application and different target proteins. Uh, second conclusion here. Yeah, so if you're aware of some of the inherent weakness and flaws of the QSAR technology, it will help you better plan for your strategy in using QSAR. Yeah, so I've been doing QSAR research for a um, pretty long time. And, you know, even now, I, th I still think that there's a lot of potential applications for it, uh, given that there is more uh, advancement in terms of deep learning, um, in terms of, you know, like being able to use um, images for training the model, which back in the days, we only harnessed tabular data, uh, physical chemical descriptor for building the model. Now they even have like information from a um, time simulation aspect, like for, for example, from molecular dynamic, you have the, the molecule, but the molecule is not static like that. You have the molecule that is constantly moving, right? And each snapshot will allow you to see like how they are dynamic, which part is flexible, which part is fixed. So all of that information, I think, makes QSAR further ground for further improvements. And I mentioned that, you know, like doing a typical QSAR is like two-dimensional QSAR, but with the added information from molecular dynamic and all of the additional um, images or molecular um, simulation, you know, features that you could add to it, you could add several dimensions to the QSAR workflow. And proteocumometric, as I have mentioned, it provides you the ability to perform drug repositioning, which I think is highly relevant nowadays in that we have several um, advancement in, you know, database storage where we're able now to store ever more data and there's you know like interactive web application framework as I've shown you um, which allows you to share your entire you know workflow with your with your peers and colleagues and yeah so that you know like collaboration will foster um, innovation and I only see that there's going to be ever more exciting opportunities that that's lying ahead um yeah so this software was you know like developed back in the days uh, in Windows. Uh, we added a graphical user interface on top of Wika. So we use Python as a wrapper, and it allows the user to perform automated uh, machine learning. And if you're interested, you could take a look at the book chapter that we publish or also from this website. So please be aware that this is old technology. We published, we created this back in 2005 or six. No, no, or 2009 or so. And it was a time when, you know, not so many auto, auto ML framework were made available. So I guess we were quite one of the early ones, but yeah, it could be improved. And yes, yeah, mentioned already, these are some examples of how we developed the uh, various web tool, bioinformatics tool using R Shiny. Uh, and nowadays we're using uh, Streamlit to, to automate the workflow and allows you know researcher to share their machine learning models, um, which I'm an advocate for. And yeah, I'll probably write some more book chapters and 
um, blog posts about that. And so if you're interested in how you could get started in computational drug discovery, well, on the hardware aspect, you know, like it really depends on what you have access to. If you have access to laptop, desktop, you know, any computer uh, will, will be fine. In terms of software, there's commercial and free. Um, but nowadays, free open source software are pretty powerful and you don't really need to have access to commercial ones. Um, with the free ones, as the one I've shown you, we could build it and you know share it for free online um, using Python, right? If you want to um, calculate the script or you have already kit, you have PaddlePy. If you want to build machine learning model, you have Scikit-Learn. You want to wrangle the data, you have Pandas, right? Um, you want to make, you want to process the data even more, you have NumPy. You want to make data visualization, you have Matplotlib, Seaborn. Um, yeah, several. And if you want to deploy it to the cloud, you have Streamlit. So yeah, the, the, the possibility is quite endless. So the programming language really depends. So I, I would recommend Python or R. Um, so yeah, take, have a look at that. And yeah, there's so many topics in the realm of computational drug discovery. And I've listed some of the topics that you could take a look further on. Um, so there, it's not required, but just in case that you want to apply it for your own research, uh, these are a good starting point for you to explore more on. And I also create free data science and machine learning bioinformatic content on YouTube and also write blogs on Medium. Yeah, so thank you. And yeah, I'll be happy to accept any questions.